Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Unauthorized Disclosure Podcast. And we're pleased to be joined again by our good friend, Ben Norton, who is an editor for Multipolarista. Uh, you've seen his work. He does a bunch of videos. Uh, you're really good at covering the Latin America region. We have you on today to discuss. Mostly, we'll probably spend time on developments in Peru, but we might get to Argentina. So welcome back. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure being here. I, I've been a longtime listener to your show as well, so it's always a pleasure. Yeah, and we appreciate the support. Uh, and you know, I was I, I was sort of talking a little bit with Rodney. I think it's really good what Multipolarista does, uh, breakthrough news, uh, like what the people over at People's Dispatch do. Just growing the shadow space proof. <laughs> yeah, but I'm going to be specific here and say that. Uh, you're building this space for you know solidarity journalism for showing this um, for understanding what's going on with uh, the grassroots and the sort of right wing attacks, but also the U.S. meddling that goes on in these countries. And you'll have people on your shows to talk about uh, these particular issues, which I'm not going to sit here and claim to do um, with my organization. I'm much more focused in a different respect. But you know, to begin. Why don't, um, so I don't usually like to do it where we like frame it in the sense of the US media, but I feel like since people might have a very limited understanding of events unfolding in Peru, I was pretty stunned at what MSNBC did here with. Uh, the coverage of the coup in Peru. Um, Ari Melber did uh, a segment. I don't know if you got to see this. But ben, did you get to see this? Do you know what I'm going to do here? No, but I know that uh, Ari Melber is, is an, he is an expert on 90s hip hop. I doubt he knows anything about Peru at all. Right. Yeah. Um, he'll have like Fat Joe on his show with Bill <laughs> yeah. Crystal to do an interview. Um, anyways, so... I, I don't want this to eat too much of our show, but I was actually pretty stunned that this is what MSNBC did. And this was how people were going to take in the story of the Peru coup. And I think it's like a nice way to not just repeat what you've been doing with your streams and your work, uh, but also like see what people are intentionally and deliberately misrepresenting and what we'll call, let's just call it the regime change media attack and try yeah. to assassinate civilian leaders all out in the open. And facing these plots, people following the law do expect action. Wouldn't you? Indictments, arrests, trials, convictions. Convictions when supported by evidence. It's all very familiar right now with what we're living through in America. But the reporting that I'm mentioning here is not only about America. Here's the news seen over the weekend in Peru where the Capitol featured a roiling debate about this nation's democracy in a response to a blatant coup attempt. You see protesters and police there, fires burning, clashes in the streets, tear gas, all part oh of the fallout God. from the country's leader making an extraordinary response to his own oh my God. looming can you, can you pause it or are you not able to? You know, I can, I'll, I'll pause whenever you ask me to. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I'll respond to it in, in more detail in a second, but this is incredible. This is Fox News level fake news. He's taking the protests against the coup against Pedro Castillo and portraying it as if they're protests against Pedro Castillo, right? He's saying that Pedro Castillo tried to launch a coup, which I'll talk about why that's completely misleading and wrong. But he's using the, the protests after of the people in support of Pedro Castillo and saying they're against him. This is straight up fake news. I mean, there's nothing subtle about it. This is the definition of fake news. It's not it's not just misleading. It is wrong. Okay, I'm actually really glad we're doing this because your real-time reaction is going to make this clip even <laughs> more gold. Pedro Castillo proclaimed that the government's impeachment process was basically a witch hunt as he was facing a repeated push to impeach him over alleged improprieties. Not well, only did true. he say he'd defy it, but he proclaimed he would seize dictatorial powers to just eliminate and dissolve Congress. That's not what he was The Congress doing. that, of course, was about to impeach him again. Now, this is hours before that planned impeachment vote on Thursday, 
He went out and addressed the nation and just claimed that he would have his own new emergency powers. He declared a national curfew, and he asserted that he had the power, supposedly, to just temporarily dissolve Congress. A cuyo efecto se dictan las siguientes medidas. Disolver temporalmente el Congreso de la República e instaurar un gobierno de emergencia excepcional. By the way, note, note how he's shaking What he's that saying video. there was that he would dictate those measures. Word choice. Many prove. Okay, anything? Yeah, I mean, uh, Ronnie, I think you're muted. You wanted to say something? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I was like, why are they not responding? I've never seen Ari Melber passionate about anything, ever. I can't believe this is what got him excited, is that he has to justify a coup. But please, go ahead, Ben. No, I mean, th this is what this is what excites and turns on all of these corporate media ghouls, is a U.S.-backed coup in another country, but portraying the victim of the coup as the coup leader. I mean, there are so many things that I'll respond to, but first of all, uh, if you look at that video, it's also important to point out that yeah, in that video, uh, Pedro Castillo, who's the democratically elected president, constitutional president of Peru, he comes from a, a poor rural area. He was a labor organizer. He was a farmer and he became a teacher. I mean, he represents the poor working class majority of Peru. In that video that in which he announced the temporary closure of Congress in accordance with Article 134 of the Constitution, which Ari Melber conveniently leaves out, that the Peruvian Constitution allows for the, 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 the dissolution of Congress, which I'll talk about later. In that video, Pedro Castillo is shaking from fear. The idea that he was like some dictatorial authoritarian leader when he was doing making this decision to try to prevent the coup against him is absurd. When you, if you look at the video, he do, he's not surrounded by military. He's, he's, he's alone. He's shaking. This is not, you know, like a stereotypical Pinochet style coup where you have a military leader surrounded with, by guys with guns or whatever. I mean, it is so ridiculous, but this is, this is what I've been saying. This is the new strategy of coups in the era of hybrid war just as the character of war has shifted pretty drastically, right? We, I mean, maybe you can say the, the proxy war in Ukraine is one of the more recent examples of a war that is a slightly more conventional war. But in general, war in the 21st century has leaned toward hybrid war. So we see information war, hy um, cyber war, right? Like, um, for instance, the Stuxnet virus that we know was created by the US and Israel against Iran or economic war for th through sanctions and blockades, psychological warfare. Uh, NATO recently published a study on cognitive warfare. The point is that the character of warfare has changed in many ways, and the character of these coups has also changed, the strategy of these coups, and we're seeing new, more sophisticated coups. So this coup in Peru is pretty similar in some ways to the coup in Bolivia in 2019, and you probably remember that the narrative was that Evo Morales was a dictator and that the coup was actually saving Bolivian democracy from the so-called dictator. Similarly, I mean, it's not exactly the same scenario. The narrative is that Pedro Castillo was trying to launch a coup when in reality it was a coup against him. And now we see videos and photos across Peru of military forces deployed, soldiers and military police heavily armed with weapons. The... Uh, the human rights arm of the Peruvian government, even they admitted that the military in Peru is using helicopters to shoot at protesters and drop tear gas bombs on them. Like, this is what the U.S. government and the media is referring to as the constitutional democratic government. And they call Pedro Castillo undemocratic, even though what he was doing was allowed within the Constitution, which we can talk about. It was to prevent a coup against him by a completely corrupt, anti-democratic, oligarch-controlled Congress, with, which had a 7% approval rating in September, and which has, in very recent history, been exposed for bribing Congress people to vote to impeach president, presidents who are elected by the people. I mean, it's pretty wild, too, because you, of course, like get this narrative 
every single time from the mainstream liberal media in the US. But I'm curious, you know, now that you have a different region, like you have a different region now than you did well, even a year ago, right? Even, you know, definitely more than two years ago. But I'm curious, like how that's playing out with respect to this. I know a lot of Latin American leaders have come out and actually sided with Pedro Castillo. I'm not sure which ones actually, but I know a bunch have, and I can't imagine that would have been the case a couple of years ago. I haven't heard much about the role of the Organization of American States. Maybe they have had a role so far, but typically like in past coups, they've played a very prominent role in uh, basically like giving cover to it like they did in Bolivia. So how is that sort of regional situation playing out right now? Yeah, I mean, it's completely different. You're right. Almost the entire region is publicly against the coup, publicly rejecting the coup. And many countries in the region, including some of the largest countries, recognize Pedro Castillo still as president. They refuse to recognize the coup regime. Of course, the United States has been supporting this coup from day one. And the U.S. has been very publicly proclaiming the State Department every single day, basically releasing a new statement saying they support the coup regime. But what's incredible is, I think really probably for the first time since 2009, the region is publicly opposing the U.S. and opposing a coup. What happened in 2009, there was a coup in Honduras. However, at that moment, the Organization of American States, although it's never been a good organization, was a little better and in, in, was a little better in opposing the coup in Honduras in 2009, which was a blatant military coup. And most of the region at that time had left-wing governments, and they also supported the elected president, Mawa Salaya. Of course, he was not re reinstalled in power. The coup regime continued to govern with U.S. support, and the coup regime in Honduras continued governing until 2020, late 2021. So uh, if you go from 2009 until today, uh, that's when you had another series of coups, a soft coup in Paraguay in 2012, two coups, uh, soft coups in Brazil in 2016 and 2018, the violent coup in Bolivia in 2019, the coup attempt against Venezuela with Juan Guaido in 2019 as well. So in all of those coups, the region was pretty divided. And of course, all the right wing governments, which are just U.S. puppets, supported the coups. But today, I think really it's historic in that the majority of the region is publicly against the U.S. condemning this coup. So Mexico, which is the second most populous country after Brazil. Of course, Brazil still technically has Jair Bolsonaro in power. He's actually busy trying to launch his own coup, which is not working, but trying to have a violent coup to prevent Lula da Silva from coming in on January 1st, which is inauguration in Brazil. So excluding Brazil, all of the other largest countries in the region are against this coup. So that's Mexico is the second most populous. Then uh, Colombia is the third most populous. Argentina as well, fourth most populous. So uh, Mexico, Argentina, Bolivia, and Colombia, they released a joint statement recognizing Pedro Castillo as constitutional president. So that was clearly them condemning the coup and saying they still recognize Castillo. Furthermore, on the, on the 14th, the ALBA, the Bolivarian Alliance, held a, a summit, their 18th annual summit in Cuba, and the ALBA is a leftist alliance, economic and political alliance that was created in 2004 by Cuba and Venezuela, by Fidel Castro and Hugo Chavez. And it, it brings together uh, Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, and Bolivia, and also numerous Caribbean countries, including Grenada, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, St. Lucia, Antigua and Bar Barbuda. So they released a joint statement also condemning the coup in Peru and recognizing Castillo as the constitutional elected president. So that means that, again, I'll, I'll name the countries that have pub, and also Honduras, because of course Honduras was a victim of a coup in 2009. It's a very sensitive issue for them. And in, in 2021, for the first time since the coup in 2009, there were democratic elections and the left wing won those elections. And the current president, Samara Castro, is the wife of the former president, uh, Manuel Salaya, who was overthrown in the 2009 coup. So, and, and they're from the same party. Her party is called the Libre Party, which means the free, free party or freedom party. And, um, and her husband is the leader of the party. So they kind of, you know, he's clearly, even though he technically doesn't have a role in the government, he's playing a role in her administration. 
So um, Honduras, Mexico, Argentina, Bolivia, Colombia, Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, and multiple Caribbean nations have all publicly condemned the coup. That means that the only governments in the region right now that have publicly expressed support for the coup government are, of course, Brazil, Ecuador, which is governed by a right-wing multimillionaire banker who's very corrupt and has hundreds of millions of dollars of properties, including he has tens of millions of dollars of properties located in Florida itself. I mean, he's just cartoonishly corrupt. So Ecuador, Brazil, and also Uruguay has a right-wing government and Costa Rica, which is just a U.S. colony, basically. So those are the only governments, along with the U.S. and Canada, that actually support the coup regime in Peru. So it's pretty incredible that this is a complete polar shift compared to the 2019 coup attempt in Venezuela, where the majority of the governments in the region did recognize uh, Juan Guaido, who had never participated in a presidential election as the fake president of Venezuela. Whereas now we have the majority of the countries in the region still recognize Castillo, who was in prison. So he was arrested, which, by the way, shows how much of a so-called dictator he was. What kind of dictator is immediately arrested by the military? And then like the military published a photo on Twitter showing him in detention. That's some kind of great, powerful dictator. So he was immediately arrested after he tried to dissolve the Congress, citing the, US, the, the Peruvian constitution, according to Article 134, which I can talk about in a second. And then they immediately arrested him. And now, just, just uh, today is the 16th. The Peruvian coup regime had a complete fake trial. I mean, he wasn't even represented. It was like, it was a, a hearing, a legal hearing. It was a kangaroo court where he didn't even get to represent himself. And they sentenced him to 18 months in what they call preventative prison for treason. So they had a complete fake trial where he did, had no democratic rights, no due process. And then they've now ordered the elected president to go to prison for 18 months. And the U.S. refers to this as the restoration of democracy. And the U.S. ambassador in Peru has been praising the coup regime for defending democracy in scare quotes. And by the way, a, a curious fact about the US ambassador in Peru, she is a so-called former CIA agent. And we all know there's no such thing as a former CIA agent. <laughs> Unless you're like in prison for being a CIA whistleblower like John Kiriakou. If you, if you leave the CIA voluntarily and they don't imprison you or kill you, you're not a former CIA agent. She is a CIA asset, a CIA veteran who is overseeing the coup in Peru. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, so I want to finish this clip because there's a twist to it. We saw it as a dictator trying to dictate a coup in a nation that has faced real effective military coups before. Protests were swift and Castillo's supporters, though, were also vocal as this all played out. Wait, wait, pause it, pause it. But, wait, wait, oh, I guess you can't go back. We start with break. Well, I could go back. Can you go back a few seconds? Like there? Yeah, yeah but go forward a little bit. This is amazing. This you want to freeze this frame? Fox News. Right there, right there, there. Okay. Anyone who has an elementary understanding of basic Spanish can see the signs are against the U.S. backed coup. The sign says, Dina Boluarte, who's the coup leader, traidora. Traidora. That means traitor. They are referring to the unelected coup leader, Dina Boluarte, Dina Boluarte, who's backed by the U.S. as a traitor. This is a protest against the coup in support of Pedro Castillo. But they're using the video and portraying it as if it were a protest against well, so did Pedro you hear Castillo. what he said? He, like, stopped himself. Actually, like, I don't know. Maybe he understands because he stopped himself and he goes, well, there are some people coming out for Pedro Castillo. That's what he said. Did you hear that yeah, part? But, I mean, like... The yeah, it's, it's so really misleading the way they're presenting. Yeah. This reminds me of when Fox News had a report on the tiny U.S. backed protests in Cuba, if you remember. Yeah, and they Fox News showed protests that were in support of the Cuban Revolution and the Cuban government, and used the video footage saying that they were against the government. Okay, I'm mm -hmm. gonna keep going here. And Castillo's supporters, though, were also vocal as this all played out. 
We start with breaking news from Peru, where President Pedro Castillo says that he's dissolving Congress. Within just three hours of the current president's attempt to overthrow the government, the legislature overwhelmingly voted to impeach President Castillo. A favor, 101 congresistas. <clears throat> ha sido aprobada la resolución que declara la vacancia de la presidencia de la República. We're here to defend the rule of law democracy and to back the Republicas Congress. Now that was just some of what the standoff looked like immediately. The protests continue tonight, and as I mentioned. But here's what's different now. Castillo is no longer in office. That Congress was not dissolved. His own cabinet swiftly resigned in protest. That impeachment he was trying to forestall went forward. A court in that country declared his effort an invalid maneuver. The coup failed. You might be thinking, well, that's a lot, Ari. I see where you're going with this. But that's not all. Peruvian authorities charged Castillo with rebellion and conspiracy. They arrested him. He's now in custody, as you can see right there. And he had no trial. The government's trial. reaction to this indicted rebellion from within, from the most powerful official in government, was to impeach him, remove him, and swiftly arrest him, as the headlines show. The sheer speed of that defenestration is remarkable. Castillo woke up Thursday as the president, surrounded by guards running the military. And you say, okay. Okay, so um, I took out a whole section about Germany and the coup plotters there. And then I'll finish the clip here. And this is why I took time to show this, because the recontextualization is amazing. Hey, Ari, there's a lot of things going on in the world all the time. Why is this the top story in American news broadcast? Because admittedly, January we don't 6th. do news about every other country every night. A lot of the news is nationalized. And you, you watch American MSNBC, you get so a lot why? of American news. Why? Well, this is American news in a way. Oh. Because oh. this is a glaring contrast, what you just saw, to what's happening in this country. So predictable. Which talks so much about being a leader on democracy, which means defending it against the criminals who would destroy it and rob it and steal it and oppress you. But this is a nation where an almost two-year investigation and prosecution oh my has led to hundreds of arrests for the Trump fans who physically stormed the Capitol, who attacked police, who brazenly and openly talked up assassinating Politicians that day, Republicans and Democrats alike, Pence and Pelosi alike, as they quite literally obstructed and delayed the counting of the votes, one of several crimes committed, including the now convicted crime of sedition as well. U.S. backed coup put into the context of January 6th. I mean, this is just so insulting and it's so condescending. A little note about that. I mean, this is a kind of subtle thing, but it shows once again, this, you know, the propaganda. If you watch that segment, they had a, an English language voiceover of the guy who was protesting against Castillo, but they didn't have an English language voiceover for the in, uh, indigenous descent woman who was protesting against the coup in support of Castillo, who was saying that the Congress is corrupt. He, she was saying that Castillo was elected and we want our president back. They showed a few of the protests and people had signs. And ironically, some of the people had signs that said, Sierra el Congreso, which says, which in Spanish says, close the Congress. These are people who support Pedro Castillo's attempt to close the Congress. While, the, and while MSNBC is saying that, that he's a dictator. Well, if he's a dictator, why are so many people out in the streets supporting him and saying that they want the Congress to be closed? Because the Congress in Peru is not a democratic Congress. It is an anti-democratic instrument of the oligarchy. So there are so many examples of this. In 2018, there was a huge scandal in Peru that, that rocked the country called the Mamani's Video scandal. In that scandal, there were leaked vi videos that show right-wing members of Congress bribing other Congress people to vote for what they call presidential vacancy. This is the process by which the Congress of Peru can, it's, which is a unicameral Congress, one chamber, chamber can, with a majority vote, can overthrow the elected president if they declare the president to have a moral incapacity, according to the Constitution, Article 113. So what that means is that all the Congress needs to do, which is dominated by the right-wing oligarchy, is bribe enough people to vote to overthrow the democratically elected president. 
So when Pedro Castillo won the presidential election and he ran in two rounds, he won the first round and the runoff. There is no one who says who can claim that he doesn't have a Democratic mandate. He, he entered office on July 28, 2021, and immediately the Congress tried to overthrow him. And on December 7th, the day he temporarily dissolved, he tried to temporarily dissolve Congress, according to the Constitution, which is legally allowed. The Congress was on the third coup attempt against him in just over a year. So, I mean, this, again, in September, a poll showed that the Congress in Peru had 7% approval. The majority of it was dominated by the right wing, including literal fascists who were loyal to the former dictatorship of Peru, of Alberto Fujimori. Now, people might have heard that name. He is the, the most recent dictator in Latin America. You know, people know probably about Pinochet. They know about uh, Videla in, in Argentina. They know about Trujillo in, in Dominicana. But they might not know that the most recent far-right dictator in Latin America ruled until 2000, Alberto Fujimori. He was a U.S.-backed fascist dictator who ruled from 1990 until 2000. He murdered th and tortured and disappeared thousands of leftists. He, he is the one who originally actually dissolved Congress with the U.S. support. And he created a new constitution with a complete dictatorship without a democratic mandate. And in that constitution, which is still the constitution that Peru has today, he has Article 113 that allows the Congress to remove the president if they, have, if they declare the president to be morally incapable. But of course, for him, it didn't matter because he just handpicked all the people in the Congress. And it has Article 134 that says that the president can dissolve Congress if the Congress on two occasions takes legal action against or votes against the council of ministers and if the so i mean there are legal experts who are arguing that pedro castillo i mean the, the extremely obstructionist congress had done that multiple times to him so he there could be a legal argument that he could legally dissolve the congress and if you actually listen to what he said when he announced the temporary closure of the congress he said it was temporary and they were going to hold congressional elections as soon as possible, and a, a constitutional referendum to write a new constitution. That was why he was trying to dissolve Congress. It was to prevent the congressional coup against him, which was the third congressional coup against him in just over a year, by an extremely unpopular anti-democratic Congress that has been, in recent history, been exposed for bribing Congress people to vote for presidential vacancy. That is the process of removing the president in a coup. So, he wanted to create a new constitution with a democratic mandate through a democratic referendum, which is something that Chile has been trying to do as well. Unfortunately, it did not pass in Chile because Chile also still has the fascist constitution inherited from the Pinochet dictatorship. And this is a widely popular demand in Peru. So that's why if you look at the protests that have gone on all across Peru in every major city, especially in rural areas, because Pedro Castillo represented the poor and working class majority who are of our indigenous descent and have been ignored and marginalized and oppressed and discriminated against by the Peruvian elite for decades. I myself have translated some of the videos. Unfortunately, I'm not in Peru, but I've translated some of the videos of some of these protests that have been viral on social media. And you see these dark skinned indigenous descent Peruvians who are farmers and they say, we support Castillo because he's the first president who has ever represented us. We've been governed. In fact, what's funny is they usually say we've been governed by foreigners our entire lives, which I mean, it, technically they aren't foreigners. But what they mean is, you know, like, for instance, one of the more recent uh, right wing presidents was named Pedro Pablo Kuczynski. Kuczynski is clearly not a, uh, an indigenous last name. It's a Polish last name. I mentioned uh Alberto Fujimori, that's what they, yeah. that's how they call him in Spanish. But actually, his real last name is Fujimori because he's Japanese. I mean, he's, I don't want to, like, go, to, go through this narrative that, like, I mean, when they say that they're not doing it, like, in a racist way that, like, people in the U.S. say about, about immigrants, right? What they mean is that, look, the indigenous majority of our country has never had representation in government. And as soon as someone from our community, a rural farmer and teacher who led a teacher's strike, 
at Pedro Castillo. The reason he became a national figure is he led a teacher strike. And as soon as he enters office, they immediately try to launch three coups, coup attempts against him. And by the way, I didn't even mention the ju judiciary, which plays into um, Argentina and the whole concept of lawfare. Uh -huh. Immediately from day one, the right-wing oligarch-controlled judiciary in Peru, which is not elected and is also notoriously corrupt. There are so many examples in the Peruvian media of judges being exposed for taking bribes by right-wing oligarchs. Because, of course, all across Latin America, like in the U.S., of course, the country is controlled by a bunch of, a small handful of multi-millionaire or billionaire capitalist oligarchs. And especially in the case of Latin America, where people are much poorer, these oligarchs have so much control and they can bribe politicians and they can buy votes in Congress and buy off judges. This is exactly what happened in Argentina. There are literally photos of representatives from the main media outlets and corporations go flying on planes and having dinner with the judges who prosecuted the vice president and former president, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, with a judicial coup against her. Anyway, the point is that as immediately after Pedro Castillo entered office in Peru, they tried to do the same thing against him, accusing him of terrorism, which is insane, accusing him constantly in fake corruption cases. And in fact, MSNBC, they, they gave legitimacy to these fake corruption charges. He, he, yeah, like he, he's had like 50 ministers because in one year, because the Congress is constantly trying to overthrow his ministers. Multiple ministers resigned because they said that their family members were threatened like their wives and children were threatened. I mean, what we're seeing is a vicious right-wing oligarchic attack on any semblance of popular democracy all across Latin America. And anytime a president tries to take action to defend themselves, it's portrayed as authoritarian. It's the same in Nicaragua, in Venezuela, in Bolivia, and now in Peru, in Mexico. In Mexico, when there's the same tactics against the president Andrés Manuel López Obrador, Anytime a president tries to defend their democratic mandate, they're called a dictator. And if a president tries to stop a coup, then they're called a dictator who tried to launch a coup. And that's exactly what happened in Peru, which is why we see such massive protests across the country, everywhere, demanding that Pedro Castillo be released, demanding new elections, and also, most important of all, demanding a a constitutional, a constituent assembly to create a new constitution because they recognize that, that this constitution in Peru is a complete failure. It was written by the Fujimori dictatorship and, and they, it does not allow for an actual democratic government in any way, which is why right after Hugo Chavez, when he won the presidential election, he was not a dictator. When Hugo Chavez became president in 1999 in Venezuela, what was the first thing he did? He had a democratic constitutional referendum to create a new constitution. And that's what Pedro Castillo was trying to do in Peru. But of course, at every single stage, they were trying to overthrow him. So since you're talking about the rest of the region, I'm curious if maybe it's a good time, unless you have something else about Peru that you want to ask, Kevin. I was Well, gonna... so just, I, I think it's worth having you outline specifically, if you're able, Ben, the tactic of picking out individual cabinet ministers in Pedro Castillo's government to destabilize and intentionally make it difficult for Castillo's agenda to proceed forward because he's gotten a lot of flack, Castillo, and especially from the left, he's gotten flack for not defending these ministers, for believing that if he just let them go and replace them, he would be able to get past these right-wing attacks but rather than blaming castillo who is in prison and detained and can't really do anything to help peruvians right now you know we should be focused on the seeds of this fascism that has risen in uh, peru this oligarch action that has taken control and people should understand the clear tactic that was used in order to you know, chip away and get to this moment where they could seize power. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been talking to a lot of friends in Peru, a lot of activists, especially in, in Cusco, which is like a rural area in the Andean mountains, Andean region, which 
is like the base of support for uh, Pedro Castillo. And there's a lot of organized unions and labor. And one of the points that they've been saying is that, I mean, they don't really blame Castillo because one, he had literally no political experience ever. I mean, he was a teacher in a rural area and a farmer. And then he, be, he was the leader of a teacher strike that became nationwide. And then he became candidate and no one thought he was going to win. And he actually won the election. So he, I mean, he, he had no experience. So obviously it was very difficult for him. And, and even with someone with a lot of political experience, it would be impossible to govern in a situation like that. But one of the criticisms that they've said certainly is that he, he easily very, he gave in to a lot of that pressure. So what, for instance, this is one of the, the ways that I mentioned that he's had dozens of ministers in just over a year. I mean, I think he's had five prime ministers. So in um, Peru, the system is that you have all your ministers and then you also elect someone who's what they call the president of the council of ministers, which you can call a prime minister. So he, I think he's had five prime ministers in just over a year because what happened anytime he appointed one, like one time he had this guy whose name was Guido Bellido, who was a known socialist activist. And immediately the judiciary started filing cases against him saying that he was linked to terrorism. So then all the media outlets say that the prime minister of Peru is a terrorist. He's linked to terrorism. Of course, there's no evidence. And this, a lot of this, you have to go back to the, the concept of this thing that they used in the 1990s. I mentioned of the, the Fujimori dictatorship, which committed genocide backed by the U.S. In fact, USAID, the U.S. Agency for International Development, funded a family planning program, in scare quotes, that Fujimori carried out in which he sterilized 300,000 indigenous people. Many of them were forcibly sterilized. Some of them were voluntarily sterilized in scare quotes, but they were misled, right? So literally, I mean, that's the textbook definition of genocide and USAID funded that. Like, <laughs> So anyway, the point is that in the 90s, there was, there was basically a kind of civil war in Peru. And this goes back to this crazy Maoist group called Sendero Luminoso, known as Shining Path. And they're like the stereotype of like the most insanely sectarian group you can imagine. They were like hardcore Maoists who said the Soviet Union was fascist and they were against Cuba and against every other leftist government. And they spent most of their time killing other leftists for calling them like revisionists and social fascists and didn't spend mu that much time actually opposing the fascist regime. And because, I mean, but they did have some support in rural areas because Peru is like still partially a feudal country and they've never had land reform. And it's basically the most conservative country in all of the Americas. I mean, even more than Colombia. I mean, Colombia, which is deeply reactionary and right wing. I mean, they do finally have their first ever left wing government um, led by President Gustavo Petro. I mean, Peru has like, it's just, it's completely reactionary. It's an example of a country where like the feudal oligarchy that controlled like were all the landlords, they never had real reform. And the majority of the population are farmers and they're indigenous. And it's just, it's extremely repressive. So um, anyway, the point is that in the 90s, there was this kind of civil war and there was this group, Sendero Luminoso. And because they were so violent, even though they did have some support in rural areas, the government, the Fujimori dictatorship was extremely heavy handed and brutal and violent. And just massacred a lot of people in indigenous areas, which also pushed indigenous people, some of them into the arms of Sendero Luminoso. It's a complicated story. And it was this feedback loop. And then basically anyone who opposed the dictatorship was called a terrorist because they could say that, oh, you support Sendero Luminoso, therefore you're a terrorist. And thousands of leftists, many of whom were actually targeted by Sendero Luminoso, right? Like they were not supporters of this group. They were imprisoned and tortured and killed and disappeared. And so basically the Peruvian left was completely destroyed. Peru has never had a left-wing government and the left was literally crushed. It was physically dismantled under the Fujimori dictatorship. So what we've seen in the past few years is the gradual reconstruction of a left. And there was this party called Peru Libre, which is the party that Castillo entered an office with, but Basically, anyone from his party who was like a congressperson or a minister, they all were faced with charges from the judiciary claiming that they were linked to terrorism or corruption. 
so what the response of Castillo was often just to replace them with another minister. So an example of this is literally two weeks into his government, in August of 2021, his foreign minister was a longtime socialist activist who actually was against the Maoists, against Senator Luminoso. And he actually claimed that Senator Luminoso was backed by the CIA in order to kill other parts of the left. I mean, whatever. But the, anyway, it's a complicated story. But he, his name was Hector Behar. Hector Behar was um, foreign minister for like seven days. And then the military told um, Pedro Castillo to force him to resign, claiming that he was linked to terrorism. So literally two weeks into his administration, uh, Castillo was forced by the military to replace his foreign minister with like a much more moderate kind of centrist foreign minister. And then in response to that, Hector Bejar, he did an interview with the Peruvian media outlet. This is three weeks into the presidency. And he says, this is the beginning of a coup. And he said, the ultimate goal is removing Pedro Castillo. So, I mean, like everyone in Peru knew this was the goal. Honestly, I'm actually surprised that Castillo held on so long. I think the reason he was able to hold on so long is because he just kept replacing all his ministers and giving in and making compromises. And after the third attempt at a coup, he said, fine, I'm done with these compromises. I'm just, I'm going to try to stop this coup with a dissolution of a temporary dissolution of Congress. And by trying to save himself from the coup that he gave ammunition to the, the actual coup plotters to accuse him of launching a coup. So I wanted to move to the issue of Argentina because, you know, uh, one way that you portray, you, you frame this, which was really good, the way you framed it on Multipolarista was two coups uh, in Latin America, basically at the same time. Uh, obviously, Argentina is a little bit different, but can you explain to our listeners and viewers what happened there? Yeah, this is much more cut and dry. So this is a classic example of a judicial coup. This coup is very similar to the 2018 coup against Lula da Silva in Bolivia, in, in Brazil, excuse me. So just as the coup going on right now, this December in um, Peru is similar to the 2019 coup in Bolivia against Evo Morales, the judicial coup against Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner in Argentina is similar to the 2018 coup in Brazil. So what happened in 2018 in Brazil? There was a presidential election coming up and Lula da Silva, who was former president, the, one of the most popular leaders in the entire world, when he left office, he had like an 80% approval rating. It's insane. So Lula was going to run again for president in 2018, but he was imprisoned on fake corruption charges. Why do I say they were fake? Because this later, the Brazilian Supreme Court, a few years later, ruled that the charges against him were fraudulent and that he was imprisoned on false charges, on false pretenses, and they expunged his record. And then the United Nations Human Rights Committee their legal experts also said that it was a fraudulent case and that Lula da Silva's legal rights and civil rights were violated. So that's as cut as dry as it cut and dry as it gets as a case of what you could call lawfare, judicial warfare, in which right-wing oligarchic forces use the judiciary as a weapon to attack and destabilize elected popular leaders who are pretty much always from the left, right? So fast forward now to oh, sorry. So what happened in 2018 is the judge. Sergio Moro, who was a CIA asset working with the U.S. Justice Department, he imprisoned Lula da Silva on fake corruption charges. And then immediately uh, the election happened and Bolsonaro won the election. So all the polls had showed that Lula would easily have beaten Bolsonaro in, in the election. So they imprisoned Lula, removing one of the main candidates, which handed the victory to Bolsonaro because the, the candidate who ended up running for the Workers' Party, Fernando Haddad, only had like a few months to campaign. Most people in the country didn't even know who he was. So it was not a fair election. That's the only reason Bolsonaro came to power. And immediately, what did Bolsonaro do? He rewarded the judge who imprisoned Lula by promoting him to not only justice minister, but what he called his super justice minister, overseeing like way more authority than any other justice minister had ever had. So immediately after Bolsonaro entered office, he and that judge who became a super justice minister, Sergio Moro, went to Virginia, to Langley, and they visited CIA headquarters, clearly thanking the CIA for backing the coup. I mean, this is all out in the public. The Associated Press reported on Bolsonaro and Moro visiting the CIA headquarters. Okay, 
So now fast forward to Argentina. It's a very similar case. The, in Argentina, like in, in Brazil, there was a military dictatorship until very recently. In the case of Argentina, the far-right U.S.-backed military dictatorship did not end until 1983. And that was one of the most brutal dictatorships in all of the region. Thousand, tens of thousands of leftists were killed, tortured, disappeared. There are, you probably, many people might have famously seen that there are these um, elderly women in Argentina who dress in all white. And they go to the plaza. They're called the women of the plaza, the main plaza in Buenos Aires, the capital. And they have these protests. They've been doing this for many years, demanding information about all of their children who were disappeared by the dictatorship. Okay, so Argentina inherits this, this history, very recent history of a right-wing dictatorship and a deeply right-wing and corrupt judiciary. Because all of these corrupt judiciaries, they have their roots really in the dictatorships, right? Because under Pinochet in Chile, under Videla in uh, Argentina, under Fujimori in Peru, the judiciary just became a political arm of the dictatorship. And then after they, they restored, you know, bourgeois democracy, but they never really had like a thorough process of like creating new institutions, right? Ex excluding Venezuela, which is why Venezuela has been able to hold on, or Nicaragua, like they had actual revolutions, right? And most of these processes, we see like piecemeal reforms by social democratic movements, right? They're very progressive. They have a redistributive agenda, but they're not able to fundamentally transform the structures of the state. So the judici judiciary becomes an institution that represents the old vestiges of like the right-wing oligarchy and the dictatorship. And in the case of Argentina, this is the most clear example of this. I mean, in all of the region, the, the ju ju judiciary in Argentina is like the most infamously corrupt and right-wing. And I mentioned that in this most recent case, so this was one day before the coup against Pedro Castillo. On December 6th, the judiciary in Argentina sentenced the former president and current vice president, Cristina Fernández de Kirchner, to prison for six years. That's not the real scandal. Honestly, she's probably not going to go to prison because she's going to appeal the case. However, the other part of the sentence is that because she was sentenced, she now can't serve in a public office. So this is a way of the judiciary preventing her from running again for president because she, like Lula Silva, was thinking of returning to become president because the situation in Argentina is a disaster. So she governed two terms and then she left office. And now she's vice president as part of a coalition government with a kind of centrist leader named Alberto Fernandez. And it was supposed to be a power sharing agreement. The, she, they created this, this um, unity uh, of all these different parties from like the center to the left called the Frente de Todos, which means the front of everyone. And the agreement was supposed to be that the president, Alberto Fernandez, kind of like center liberal, he would give a power sharing agreement and he would have half the ministers and the other half of the ministers would be appointed by Cristina, who is the leftist, and she would have more power. But basically what happened is they entered and he basically re reneged in his side of the agreement a bunch of her ministers resigned in protest, and he basically screwed her over. So there's been like this constant conflict. It's in a, it's like, there's a very weird scenario where like the president and the vice president basically like publicly never appear together. And Cristina has actually publicly criticized the president. So everyone knew that she was going to run for president again in next year's elections in 2023. So the right wing opposition knew that if she ran for president, she could probably win. So what was their response? a fake case against her of corruption to prevent her from ever being president. So she cannot run now in 2023. And in response to the case, even though she's going to appeal it, she said that she's not going to run for president. So in this case, by the way, there is evidence showing that the actual judicial decision, the, the, um, they say condena in Spanish. What do you call that? The, um, uh, like the, Con the sentence, the sentence, the judicial sentence was written in 2019. The exact language, there's evidence showing, you know, like how um, sometimes in, like in Congress, there's these bills that are like written by a bunch of lobby groups and they like, they like go on the metadata of the word document and find that it was like written by like Alec or whatever, like one of these groups, right? So this is exactly what happened in Argentina. The judicial decision was written in 2019, but they waited until now to prevent her from because if it was in 2019, she could have appealed it and then like all that. And she could have run again in 2023. This is a judicial coup to prevent her from being president, which means honestly, 
the left in Argentina is screwed because they have no other significant leader who can run for president that could probably win, which means I would estimate there's a 90% chance the right wing is going to win the election next year, but you can't call it a fair election. And one other final point here, just to get an idea of this. Since 2004, there's a really good group in Latin America called the Center for Strategic Study of Geopolitics in Latin America. They did a study that showed that there have been 654 legal complaints filed against Cristina since 2004. 654. And of those, six individuals are responsible for individually between 20 and 70 legal complaints against her. So this is what we're talking about. Basically, every few weeks, there's another lawsuit filed against her. You cannot have a democracy in this kind of situation. And yet the US government praised the coup in Peru as a restoration of democracy in scare quotes, and the US government praised this judicial decision as a constitutional process fighting corruption or whatever. I well, want to warn you, you guys, my doorbell might ring in a moment. And if it does, I'll just slip out and come back. Anyways. Okay. okay. Well, I was going to wind this down. I want to be respectful of my co-host's time, uh, which is shared between like a dozen or more shows at this point, I believe. You probably feel like you're doing like, like many, many shows. But um, uh, every time you've been on our show this year, we've, we've had you more than any other guest. Uh, you, uh, oh, that's, that's you, a privilege. Awesome. You, it's an honor. Uh, yeah. Well, we don't, we don't, we don't plan these coups. The CIA does. So, uh, <laughs> if, if they would stop doing the coups, maybe we would have less reason to lead on you and your expertise, but, um, I guess that makes you useful, but, uh, we got to talk about something that's going to make everyone angry in the comments of our video when we, when we post this, cause you're, you're such a, a polarizing big figure to our audience. Uh, so let me ask you as, as we end here, because I, I started by praising the international solidarity journalism that Multipolarista does and that these other outlets do, like, like Rania's Breakthrough News and People's Dispatch. But that's under threat, I would suggest. I mean, our ability to share videos, real-time reporting from the Latin America region, it's, it's, it's under threat because an oligarch has bought Twitter and is running it underground. So a key mechanism for sharing information. Now, granted, I realize having prior discussions with people uh, like Alan McLeod that Facebook is massive. Facebook is a massive means for people around the globe to share information. Uh, but it also, it's, it's, it's no alternative to the way in which uh, Twitter just allows you to like focus in on snippets of information and, and share those like a particular piece of audio, a particular video clip, a particular nugget of information that you want people to focus their attention on. It's, it's very easy to target people's attention. And we're seeing very openly that a billionaire is running this platform into the ground and uh, do you think doing so in a manner that is going to benefit the plutocrats and the oligarchs of numerous countries around the world who align themselves with the U.S. government? So I just wanted to give you a chance to comment and put the act actions that we are observing and that we experience as journalists who use the platform, but others are seeing as well. Put it in the context of what happens in Latin America where the right-wing oligarchs take over the media ecosystems or have controlled the media e ecosystems. And it's not to say that we haven't had, we don't have right-wing oligarchs who control the media ecosystem in the U.S. They do, but this seems like an expansion of their power and domination over the information environment. Yeah, I mean, what's, in, what's incredible is that, you know, capitalism around the world has really most you know, uh, capitalists and governments, capitalist governments have kind of stopped the pretense of really caring about a more equitable, kind, charitable capitalism with equal representation. It's just on, full on oligarchy everywhere. I mean, this is just this extremely decadent crisis of capitalism everywhere we see. And certainly in Latin America, it's pretty blatant. But I mean, increasingly in the U.S. as well. Obviously, the U.S. has had oligarchs for a long time, going back to the robber barons. George Washington was a huge land speculator. Most of the so-called founding fathers were 
in modern standards, millionaires, and they were largely speculators, right? So it's not entirely new, but just the sheer concentration of wealth. And someone like Elon Musk is the perfect example of this because it shows how, one, in this neoliberal era of capitalism, in, in, in the imperial core, actual wealth has been largely decoupled from economic production. And I'm not in any way trying to whitewash the oligarchs of the past, but if you go back to Andrew Carnegie and the Rockefellers, like they were responsible for actual physical products that didn't, didn't necessarily kill you, right? I mean, Elon Musk, the only physical product he makes that I guess doesn't kill you maybe is like that Starlink stuff, which the US government is now trying to use to like overthrow the Iranian government and in Ukraine as well. But he makes Tesla cars, which are just like a suicide <laughs> wish, like a death trap, killing people everywhere you look. And it's incredible that it's just pure speculation. If people look the size, well, actually Tesla stock is now falling, which is maybe the bubble has finally been popped. But until a few weeks ago, Tesla's, the size of Tesla's company on the stock market was larger than all of the other major car manufacturers combined. Tesla produces like at most like tens of thousands of cars per year. And sometimes they have to do massive recalls because those cars kill you. Meanwhile, Toyota, uh, Mitsubishi, Suzuki, like all of the major Japanese manufacturers, also um, the Korean manufacturers, which I mean, I live in Latin America. Everywhere you look, you see Japanese and Korean cars around the world, right? That, that's what people drive. And then, of course, in the U.S., you still have some big companies, Germany. The point is that all of those major car companies that produce millions of cars, their stock market value is smaller than Tesla. Why is that? It's not because Teslas are actually good cars. It's pure speculation. This is fictitious capital. It's all based on driving up stock prices. And Elon Musk is the classic example of this. It's not based on anything he's actually done, right? It's just all pure speculation, billions of dollars of subsidies from the U.S. government. He's an actual welfare queen. I mean, like that guy's entire financial empire is based on constant uh, subsidies, largely from California for renewable energy, ironically. Well, he attacks, you know, California and all this, and he's talking about how great Texas is and all this nonsense. So, <laughs> I mean, and now, what, what, how did he leverage his wealth? Because most of his wealth is tied up in Tesla stocks, but he can't sell too many Tesla stocks because then that would make the price of Tesla stock fall. And it would also just be a PR like disaster. Yeah. So he has to find opportunities in which he can make an excuse to sell some of his Tesla stocks to convert that into actual some kind of more tangible capital because everyone knows that it's the most overvalued stock in history. It's all this Enron waiting to explode. So people say he's like the most wealthy man on earth. It's insane. Like who's the second most wealthy? Bill Gates. Bill Gates is himself also a vampire. He's like become like the largest landowner in the US. I mean, he's an evil man as well. Wait, is that Bezos? I thought, I thought Bezos. Oh, sorry, sorry, uh, Bezos. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess... Bezos and Bill Gates kind of go back and forth. But anyway, the point is that, all right, Bezos has Amazon, which is like a massive company <laughs> that everyone uses, right? Like think about Amazon's impact on the economy of the entire world and think about Tesla's. I mean, it's just, there's no comparison. Tesla's impact is infinitesimal. Or look at Bill Gates. Like I'm not in any way defending Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates, but like Everyone in the world uses Microsoft, like excluding like the US and maybe Europe, like Apple pr products are not really used because they're insanely expensive. Like in Latin America, I never see Apple because no one has money to pay, pay for an Apple, right? But they, everyone has Microsoft. So, I mean, again, that's not to say that like Bill Gates deserves that money. None of these oligarchs should exist. But I'm just pointing out that Elon Musk is like the perfect embodiment of this financialized era of neoliberalism where it's just like, it's fake wealth. They don't, these oligarchs don't do anything. No. They, he's not providing any services. Tesla is just like a vanity project. And it, it's, it's just a way for rich people, or people to speculate and get rich on stocks. And now he tries to convert some of his stocks from Tesla into buying, to leveraging wealth to buy uh, Twitter, by the way, with a bunch of other leverage, with a bunch of... Um, he has insane debt. 
And now he has to like, just to maintain the overhead to service his debt, he has to like charge way more than $8 a month for all the users. So, I mean, Elon Musk for me is just the perfect embodiment of just this con artist world that we're trapped in where yeah. these people think that they're like better than everyone else. He He's like really into like this weird racist, like, um, biological of determinist stuff where mm -hmm. uh, there was this weird article i don't know if you saw this where he's he has like a dozen children with like a bunch of like aryan white women and he thinks that like he has to like spread his seed as much as possible yep. to create like biologically superior humans this is what they accused julian assange of doing by the way this is this was a thing this is actually in that bullshit fifth estate movie <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, so, and like, yeah. and this guy is like a descendant of, you know, not, not to- South not Africa. To, yeah, not to, not to make the, to blame the son for the crimes of the father, but he's the descendant of South African white settlers and his father like owns a bunch of mines in South Africa. Africa. And he's like now obsessed with like, he says that, huma that human civilization is, is like in a crisis and they need to repopulate human civilization. With their superior with their, seeds. With their superior seeds, yep. It's, I mean, it, and it's like a common, apparently, mindset among the wealthy, like that they should have all the children so that they can create like leaders for the future because they are superior. I mean, this is Nazism. Like, like maybe Elon Musk doesn't personally admire Hitler. Maybe he's against Adolf Hitler, but like this is the continuation no, like kind of, of eugenics. Nazi ideology. Yeah, it's a kind of eugenics, right? Like, the idea that like everything is about merit and that they, they just have superior genetics and that's why they're so successful because they know how to work hard and be smart and create for the rest of us or something. Anyways. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, finally, I, just, I, I have two final thoughts. I want to encourage everyone who's listening to this to check out, go look up Wampy Wheels. Those are the wheels on Tesla cars. There's like this chronic case they call Wampy Wheels where like the, the wheels just like fall off Tesla cars and like wow. people have died, Jesus. but it, okay. it's not that well known, but like these, I mean, the other thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, Elon Musk, what's so infuriating is he like portrays himself as a free speech warrior. Yeah. One, I've gotten more spam in my DMS. I have open DMS in the past few months than like ever before mm. in Twitter. That's true. I can, I can add to that. Yeah. <laughs> So there's actually way more bots than before, but also more infuriating is that he says that he's like supports free speech. And now like all of these journalists, including like mainstream New York times and CNN journalists yeah. are being censored and suspended for criticizing him. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the most hypocritical BS ever. Yeah. We'll have to do another whole episode on Elon Musk and the Twitter files, but uh, I could, we could go on for a while, but I do have to, I know we, we all have stuff to do, uh, but this was a great episode. Yeah. Just let me throw in a quick plug here. I just watched uh, The Dropout. It's about Elizabeth Holmes and it's everything that Elon Musk is. It's everything about the way that these oligarch, these tech billionaire, billionaires grift. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if people want to know what Elon Musk is doing, this this is this is how you get to this point. This is mm. the, the, the 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 tale of her is the tale of every male billionaire. There's nothing unique about her because she was a woman, although that's sort of like she leveraged that. But uh, what we are seeing it very clearly is this textbook grift from Silicon Valley. Uh, so it was good to talk to you, Ben. Multipolarista.com is your website where people can go find your work um and you also have streams um shows and you're also on call-in where people can find you well i'm not uh, on call-in you're not anymore not anymore you don't no, do that anymore i haven't been okay. for a while but ronnie okay <laughs> well your thing still pops up so i got confused all right but you're on multipolarista.com is where you want to go um and uh thank you again for joining us ben thank you i always love your show and i love both of you so it's always a pleasure keep up the good work